Hello and welcome to the Queer Monkey Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the executive director and president of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the director of research, education, and outreach. And of course, on behalf of our board of directors, advisors, volunteers, and supporting members, we want to thank you for joining us today. The Queer Manga Institute's an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And as an educational institution, we take an open approach and invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this Conversation for Exploration. On these weekly Sunday discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics from neuroscience, anthropology, art history, archaeology, mytholo mythology, uh, mysticism, trance states, shamanism, wisdom tradition, sacred landscapes, dance. It goes on and on and on. And you're welcome to visit our website at kuyamangainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free, and as a nonprofit, we invite you to become a supporting member. And of course, we thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Kuyamanga Institute. You know, it's a common question that we get all the time. What's the relationship of ecstatic postures to yoga postures? Well, first, let me back up for a moment for anyone who's not familiar with what we mean by ecstatic trance postures. We see it as a rediscovery of an ancient practice, and it was the insightful work of Dr. Goodman, the founder of this institute. Her research led her on a journey of exploration to find the clues uh, interested in why posture positions are reflected in ancient art. And Dr. Goodman searched for the oldest evidence available, which she discovered in the world's collection of prehistory and indigenous art and decoded these selected artifacts as ritual instructions. Handed down through time, our earliest ancestors documented these postures and poses in selected artwork, some of which are over 30,000 years old. 40, we use some that are 40. Some, well, mm -hmm. over 40. And the yoga poses have very specific uses and, and uh, history as well. When people hear the word yoga, of course, they think of these these gymnastic-like positions and that kind of thing, but there's a much richer history to yoga and the breadth of yoga philosophy is much broader than that. So with its original origin, they're saying at least 5,000 years old, we, we really need to know more. And our guests will help us make sense of all this, the power and the history of yoga, and maybe we can find those direct parallels to our own ecstatic trance postures. Well, I'd like to know, Yoga postures are postures that we right. use from the world's collection of indigenous art going back to the Paleolithic. I'd like to know the experiences of yoga compared to our experiences. Right. And yoga really has, uh, is part of our origin story because when Dr. Goodman was doing her initial research and she was looking at the world's collection of rituals to call in the spirits, she compiled this down to its essence, right? And then it was um, the, the, the steps they all had in common. I think she did for um, the world's rituals and what Joseph Campbell did for the world's mythology, cook it down to a few essential steps. By that we mean what's in common. But she went on. And when it was the uh, article by a Canadian psychologist, V.F. Emerson, early on, 1960s, that she read that the light bulb went off. He was looking at yoga postures. Mm -hmm. And as she cites... All the functions of the body changed with alterations of posture. Emerson pointed out the heartbeat, breathing, even the motility of the intestines. And how they um, test right. that, I don't know. Uh -huh. uh, uh, she said they all changed just by holding a yoga posture. This right. is not including our ritual. This is just holding a posture. Mm -hmm. We find that later with Amy Cuddy and others. There's some galvanic skin response, breath rate. I mean, just lots of non-invasive tests you can see to say holding a posture changes, yeah. changes your, your physiology. And the light bulb went off and she just said, oh, I'm going to look at really old postures that I see documented in the um, statues, 
petroglyphs, sculptures of old. Paintings. So this has left us with the question. You see a lot of, for example, cross-legged postures, really? postures in yoga, meditative postures. You see a lot of asanas, a lot of different postures that are used. But we want to uh, turn to our guest today, Eric John Shaw, and we want to thank Thomas Riccio, our mutual friend, uh, for alerting us to Eric's work. And uh, we wanted to invite Eric to say, tell us about Kundalini. Tell us about the energy system. We have so much energy running through us when we're doing this. So do you. And tell us about the various postures. What might they have in common? We have a slideshow as well of some cross-legged postures. I thought we'd just limit it to that. Eric's got a slideshow of common yogic postures. And then the question is, um, you, yoga is well studied. Our work is not. These postures and the way we use them is not. We aim to remedy that. And then why? Why do postures matter? What are they actually doing? What are the theories? We've seen everything from you're contorting yourself like an antenna, like the old TV antennas is the, the most common example and well-known example, uh, a tuning fork. Um, we've had Jin Chin Jitsu friends say, oh, gee, I understand that posture. You're activating the heart. You're activating the, the solar plexus. These are energy centers you're activating. The meridian flow, the kundalini flow, so many theories. But I'd like to know from yoga what we can learn from one another, these, this sister um, practice. So let us welcome uh, Eric. And let me tell you a little bit about him. Hello, Eric, and welcome. He is a longtime yeah. yoga practitioner and teacher. I call him a yoga philosopher. He's going to be our guide today on the poses, the meditative, the mystical, the kundalini experiences of yoga, its history, as we seek to find these correlations. Um, he's got degrees in studio art, religious studies, uh, Asian studies. He's written over 100 articles on the yoga tradition for um, the leading platforms for yoga. He's lectured at museums, colleges, and conferences throughout Asia and North America. I guess you're our guy, Eric. Um, your guide to do this, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your long Welcome. time delve uh, into this, and we'll see what we have in common. So tell us a bit more about yourself, and what was your call to adventure, to really, I mean, a lot of people, everybody does yoga, right? Mm -hmm. We all do yoga, or have done at some point. What caused you to really want to look deep into its, its history, its origin, its, its what power. Kind of makes it, its power? Uh, well, I've always been kind of a knowledge junkie, you know, guy who likes to ruminate, um, think too much maybe. Um, and uh, I grew up with parents who were ministers uh, in a Christian tradition that was quite an open one. And I uh, grew up on the West Coast where conversations with Asian traditions is probably more rife than maybe elsewhere. Um, and it's actually surprising to me that I didn't get into yoga earlier. I didn't really gravitate towards it till I was 39. Um, before that, I'd been an athlete and um, had kind of a turn towards uh, religion, actually a call to be a minister when I was 30 years old, which was kind of fresh to me because I was very much an agnostic and <laughs> okay. anti-religious. Um, but I also uh, had a crazy mind that I couldn't control and it Took meditation to do that and that happened to me early at about the age of 24 i'm 61 now um so that's been a, a practice that i started long before i understood anything about yoga and it was more in a buddhist tradition in the early 90s i became a part of siddha yoga i don't know if anybody knows that it's a tradition that follows a certain guru it's kind of a little cult um but a good cult uh, <laughs> so uh and then in i entered a master's program in religious studies which studied the christian traditions and that was good to kind of get that that tradition kind of subsumed in my awareness and understand its limits its, its uh prolixities uh what what it's good at and what's not good at and then i studied i went into a doctoral program for the for the asian traditions after gravitating to yoga in the year 2000 um and uh that was i been doing some serious athletic endurance practice and my body was kind of breaking down and yoga seemed like a way to keep pushing myself physically but also it brought together all, all my other interests you know it was, it was spiritual it was intellectual it was teaching um like i say i'm just surprised i never gravitated to it much earlier in my life 
Um, and then I became a fanatic basically overnight. I practiced every day. I went to teachers three times a week. I eventually moved to San Francisco, which is kind of a Mecca for world yoga and got to study with practically every major yoga teacher on the planet. Um, and then developed a career in it and was able to travel widely and teach. And well, I was doing this doctoral program at the time. So I was learning what I wanted to learn about the history and philosophy and, you know, cultural latch points of the practice. And, um, I'm kind of a history fanatic mainly, but philosophy deeply appeals to me too. So I kind of got a good knowledge base in that and was able to use that in a really productive career and do some writing. I appreciate the broad, broad context in which you um, have explored all this. And that's what we're trying to do with these conversations as well, is broaden our scope right. so we can yeah. understand our, our place in the whole um, the whole march of, of expanded consciousness. So... So we're here today to look at what, I mean, tell us about the history of yoga as you understand it. How far back does it go? Well, um, there's a little bit of debate about its earliest origins. If you go back to what's called the Indus Sarasvati culture, um, about 2,500 years before Christ's birth, there's what I think is pretty clear evidence of yoga practice. There's um, what they call the Pashupati seals, which are these little kind of stamped size, statite, uh, plaques or whatever and on a number of those there's there are images of what is i think undeniably a yogi i mean scholars like to nitpick but i think sometimes you have to you know see the forest for the trees um if you step back you can kind of uh decipher this image in all its various aspects and how it points to yoga and i could talk a blue streak about that so you've got that and then you've also got small little terracotta sculptures of people in yoga poses, very simple yoga poses from that civilization as well. So, and plus it's because it's continuous with the later Hindu tradition and because the Hindu tradition has a certain stability over time where people are doing practices now that we know were being done thousands of years ago um, to suggest that yoga started in that culture, which is kind of in where, where Pakistan is today in Northwest India. Um, I don't think it's a, it's a stretch. So, Oh. I'm confident to say that we have archaeological evidence of yoga from 5,500 years ago. Got it. Thank you. Um, yoga today mostly practices an exercise. I mean, we in our secular culture love to secularize everything and despiritualize it. Do you think that the practice of yoga is necessary to derive the benefits by knowing or understanding its deeper philosophy and spiritual intent? Uh, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. I mean, um, can you get there just through postures? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, the, the gross body leverages the subtle body. We know that. I mean, you, you know it from the aspect of sound. Sound is a, a gross experience. The five senses can discern it and we can evoke spiritual states. We can enter into other dimensions. We can work with subtle energy through this grosser medium of sound that we're familiar with. It's very much true with the body as well, of course. The body, we can leverage the energetic bodies from the, the gross body. So if someone is doing that unconsciously or without good direction, um, if they're doing it in a merely kind of a PE atmosphere, physical education <laughs> atmosphere, they're going to get something. You know, they're, they're going to, they could potentially even get, you know, a deep awakening depending on how they've been prepared or what their other experiences are. But um, of course, it's sort of like the difference between McDonald's and you know French cuisine. If if you've got a better nutritional, you know, compact, then you're you're, you're gonna you can you can you're gonna be promised better results. Yeah. Um, Kundalini is something that um, you have a lot to say about the activation of it, the energetics of it. I'm really curious about that. Yeah, it's interesting. I. Yeah. I from our discussions, Laura, I kind of got prompted to undertake a bit of research that I wanted to do for decades. Um, so I just made some kind of brief contacts with people who could tell me about the manifestations in their body from their Kundalini awakenings. And again, this is not pranic awakenings. We definitely can have pranic urges. We can have spontaneous inspirations to move the body in a certain way that come from the movement of chi or life force. But that's not the same as an actual kundalini awakening that we say where that uh, an inner intelligence which i like to quote Stuart zavosky um, calls it a kind of secondary puberty in the body which has a plan 
for our sh for our energetic shift starts to do its work. Um, and when that happens, there are spontaneous movements of the eyes, there's some spontaneous movements of the tongue, there's spontaneous movements of the limbs, there's spontaneous movements of the stomach viscera, there's you know ululation sounds that are made. So um, yoga has, or rather Kundalini has a plan to clear the blocks, the, the kind of psychic um, uh, stuckedness, the knots in the body, and it does it through a very a, a set of processes which have in some cases been you know broadly cataloged. Um, I want to kind of understand that catalog better, but it uses a lot of different gross tools that or, or at least we see the gross what's going on at the gross level that's shifting the subtle reality of the body and the, the psychology in the body. Because it's really about the growth, isn't it? It's really about the understanding. It's about the process, right? Yeah, yeah. And in this case, it's a process that you lose control of. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it, it has its own intentions, just like puberty would, right? We, we can't really stop that physiological process. Once it begins, it has its own momentum and, and sets of progressions. Yeah. We call this our inner technology that is built into our DNA that can be activated through ritual, through practice, through intent, attention. So um, is this Kundalini, is with your understanding, also part of this process? This capacity is just built into us. It has its own meandering um, journey that's set up. We follow it. There's a prescription for it. It has its own ways and means. It's not random. How does it work physiologically, do you think? Um, well, I would agree with that. Yeah, I think it's encoded, you know, maybe at the level of DNA. I mean, DNA, you know, builds our other physical systems and it lies somewhere in there. Um, I think at the ultimate level, it's happening in our other energetic bodies that are not merely the gross body. Um, so, uh, and yeah, and then it's, it's processes tend to be creative. It, it tend to be, it tends to um, push itself forward in whatever way it's necessary. And we're, we're aware of that because of the range of manifestations that it shows to us. And I mean, in the, in the, in the conversation I have with a woman, I actually talked to her this morning before I talked to you guys, she talked about getting spontaneous energy locks, what we call Mula Bandha and um, Uddiyana Bandha and the energy shifting in between um, she talked about one time being forced down on the ground on the earth where she was like gripping the earth like a um, like an animal. She described another process mm -hmm. where she was in a you know our classic uh, cross-legged pose that we call sukhasana and she was dropped forward into what we would call automukho sukhasana, bended over her legs and she'd never been able to do that before. But the, the kundalini forced her into that um, position. So. There's just a lot of different ways that it can work in the physical body to accomplish its intentions. Oh, and so it forces one, it prompts one into specific postures on its kind of its sequential way, kind of reminding me of uh, San Bushman dancing and they get the energy boiling and they're, they're bent over in a certain posture. It's, yeah, uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, and, it's, and it's, it's a question as to, I mean, I've never encountered in my conversation with people that have had it that there's actually much movement or definitely gross movement in it. Usually it's a, it's a static experience or it's mm -hmm. something that's happening internally, a position of the eyes, position of the tongue, a sound. Um, I don't know if it does manifest in anything that we would call dance. Um, and may, maybe that's something more, I mean, I'm not, you know, I've, I've experienced ecstatic dance as a way in which you're responding to energy and the energy of others. Um, I don't, I think that's not the, the same level of something that we would call Kundalini. I'm not trying to make an exact correlation, just that it's interesting that postures seem to derive, both they can induce and they seem yeah. to be resulting. I mean, we also have swing and involuntary movement and um, mm -hmm. yeah. There, yeah, I think, you know, my understanding of this is that we share one physiological blueprint. We share one energy blueprint, and then there's different ways to activate them. And of course, without, we would, we would find them over and over. Goodman used to say, you can wipe out all knowledge of this and we'll still rediscover it because it's built into us. And we're going to note what's happening, what influences us, um, what, what comes to us. Uh, in, in various ways, and, and we're going to experiment this. 
I, you, uh, you know, it's interesting is yoga has so many different words and subtleties and understanding and charts mapped out so clearly. I say that for our work, we've lost the cultural DNA, but we retain the physiological DNA. And so we're just at the stage of kind of reconstruct this to understand it again, as these early ancestors did. So I appreciate that, that yours is so clearly mapped out. And um, yeah, and so well studied. So I, th I think there's something to learn. There's something to learn in the, in the sharing. Mm. So now, um, so yoga, there's from, and you're gonna show us a slideshow here in a bit, but there seems to be the yoga asanas, right? A sequence that you hold and you stretch and you're activating muscles and ligaments and energy and, and who knows what. Yeah. And then there's the sit cross-legged with your hands in a specific pose to meditate, correct? There's kind of two uses for a posture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, what we need to understand about the, the tradition in India is that there's just so many streams of spiritual practice moving forward in time, coterminous with other practices. So it's easy to get confused about which practice belongs to which tradition and okay. to be also to be to kind of work at cross purposes in our discussions of what postures are meant to do right so there, were, there were tapasic practices there were practices that were like austerities that were meant to stress the body and change the psychology that way and very intense things like anything you find from the christian tradition there's the meditative traditions which more strongly belong to to the the buddhist traditions but you also find them in hinduism and, and all the variations of hinduism and then you have the postural tradition which is actually using um, the body in a much more dynamic way than simply the meditative tradition and definitely not with the attempt to kind of attack the body that we get in the, the heat building traditions, the tapasic traditions. So those are just three streams of historical development moving forward contemporaneously in the Hindu tradition. Mm -hmm. And if there's just a light study done of posture from you know the subcontinent of India, you're going to get confused perhaps around the different philosophical bases for each one of these and the, their method for transformation because they're different methods. They're very different methods. I mean, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot. There's a ton of overlap, and there's a ton of shared technologies for similar purposes. But we can kind of create those three <laughs> larger buckets for understanding how the body is used um, historically and the rich, rich kind of spiritual breadth of technology to find uh, that come from India. Where did postures um, come into this? What is your understanding of why a posture? What difference does it make? Why use them? Why? why are they well, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's postures are leverage points. I think they're, they're ways of um, forcing the energetic structure through forcing the physical structure. I mean, in a way that's obvious, but there's an, there's an, there's an intelligent way to go about that. Right. Um, and there is a practice way to go about it. There's, you know, this is uh, the, the way I like to share with my students. It's like we in the West, as you said, we're, we're a secular culture. I mean, especially since the Enlightenment, we and we have used our vast intelligence to create technology and science. But the vast intelligence of the human mind in the Indian tradition has been used to figure out subtle technologies, to figure out different technologies for working with prana, with working with life force, the whole science of spirituality. So when you dive into that tradition, there's a lot of different ways in which this has developed over, you know, century after century after century. Um, and now I realize I've forgotten your question. <laughs> Why postures? Uh, so, yeah. I, yeah, I, well, it's, I, it's, the most, it's the most immediate thing that we have to work with. And the, and the Hindu tradition is very, anthropomorphic it's very focused on the human body the, the beauty of the body the adornment of the body the way the body is a map for mm -hmm. the cosmos and the cosmos of the body that is inside so they've done so much work to work with the most immediate tool you have you know this this is it this is where you live and breathe and see from and to have an introverted culture which is really what we see so much more in the east as opposed to the west is much more extroverted societies extroverted cultures it, it just, you know, from that, we see that where are they going to look? They're going to look subjectively. They're not going to look objectively. They're going to access a set of senses that are not merely the, you know, the empirical basis for the five senses. They're going to find much more richer senses. So that disposition in that culture 
has led to a wealth of knowledge that is quite apart from you know our objective empirical enlightenment basis based systems and they're, they're they're coming to be complementary which is awesome um but that's kind of the question as to why the bodies because hey it's here you know it's this first thing i see feel it's handy like merge out of as it is as it were map of the cosmos you said the body can be a map for the cosmos how so um well it's it's definitely the the cause the the cosmos of our consciousness right consciousness localizes in a human form and it takes a particular shape it's a, it takes a particular shape that is um regularized throughout from human to human but also it's it's specific to each human especially when you get into the deeper science of the way karmic karma manifests with, within each human psych, psychology you know psychic form so the um the way i i learned to deal with that i have my own set of creative tools and of course in you know the traditional guru disciple relationship there's going to be an understanding from a richer practitioner to a younger more you know novitional practitioner and be able to guide them through the particular creative means they might need to transcend their you know karmic condition you also said a set of senses we find senses activated senses we know senses we didn't know we have right. how are senses activated you said there's a, a rich set of uh, senses on the inner level yeah um i think it, it always emerges from quietude right I mean, you can also have the experience of what's called Shaktipat. You can have someone give it to you. Mm -hmm. Like Darshan. Someone who has, someone who has, had so, who has manifested so much energy that they can actually, you know, pop it into your system. We have, you know, extensive stories of that kind of thing, kind of the, the descent of Kundalini, which can come from above. Um, but mostly because the, the scientific method works with, you know, ratiocination, it works with the mind examining things and pulling them apart, looking into the outer world. You can do that same process in the inner world, but you have to do it through quietude. Mm -hmm. You have to close this off so you can pay attention to your interiority and hear what it's, exactly. what it's saying and doing and experiencing. And then a conversation yeah. arises because there's always voices and mm -hmm. you can start to hear those voices. There's always movements you know, inner movements, and you can start to mm -hmm. see the pattern of those movements, and you can start to see their import and how you might work with them to produce whatever is the result you'd like to produce. And a lot of direct knowing, right? Just coming into the knowing. Do you have a lot of vis visualization among the senses that are activated? What's the range of senses? Um, you, you, you can have visualization. Yeah, you, you can have, I mean, different people are oriented in different ways. People are oriented more towards subtle audible sense or subtle seeing sense. So, you know, for most of us, it's seeing. That's our primary experience. So you would have some capacity to see things that you would articulate visually. So, of course, it's not visual in the empirical sense. Right. Um, and some people actually in the process of Kundalini awakening, they are visited by guides or they're visited by spirits and they are given scenes to see. They, they're given dreams to have. Mm -hmm. So the visioning, the visioning aspect can happen that way as well. Dreams at a later date or like a waking dream during the practice? I, I've seen both. I've seen evidence of both, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You have a slideshow. Um, what would you like to show us in the, in the slideshow? Right there you go. OK. So. Um, I like your artwork. That's your original artwork. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I think it helps to kind of lay a philosophical basis for the conversations we have in the body. Um, and uh, there's a number of philosophical systems in the Hindu tradition. And I'm a fan of the one called Samkhya, uh, partly because it simplifies the understanding of us in our kind of cosmological orientation. And it also is so consistent with what we know from modern physics. Okay. And it also helps us understand how the body works and uh, its relationship to mind and awareness and information. So here we have two terms on the screen, Purusha and property. Um, Purusha, most simply we might say is just emptiness or nothingness. 
but in the Hindu tradition, that's also coterminous with uh, what we call Brahman, which is intelligence. Sure. So if we're to think about it um, in the eternal non-time, non non-time, non-spatial realm, there is a self-reflective realm that is consciousness itself. And everything, as you can see on the part of the screen to the right, mm -hmm. everything arises from that. Okay. And we know that from modern science that the Big Bang happens. We know that in a perfect vacuum, atoms will appear or disappear. Um, Somethingness arises from nothingness. We get a sense of that too. I'm in the void. I'm in the sea of all potentiality. We, yeah. Yeah, it would make sense. Um, so so in, in working with consciousness in the body, it's the same, same basic conversation. You're attempting to, you know, we talked about quietude or meditation. You're attempting to move into a spatial realm so that another intelligence can have its room to arise. And the capacity for the body to create space in itself, which is very much what we do through yoga. If you think of it, even the most physical level, we're stretching, right? But we're also learning to calm down the kind of rate of conversation, energetic conversation in the body that's, that's kind of compacted, you might suggest, like a lot of sound in a room. So it's, it's that kind of basic reality upon which the technologies of yoga are based. We're attempting to move towards the spatial orientation of consciousness to get our simplified, compacted, denser awareness into that space so that it has, a, has an opportunity to expand and see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that's kind of the basic diagram. So we've got this, this conversation between what is dense, what is spatial, what arises into the cosmos out of nothingness, but that conversation never ends. And that conversation is what leads to our evolutionary development. It's that constant engagement with, what we, you know, we might just call it possibility, with space, with consciousness at a broader, less specific, less, specific, less localized level, which allows us to take our localized consciousness and bring it into new levels of understanding. Mm -hmm. And yoga does that with the body and a whole range of other, you know, technologies, meditative practices, visualization practices, breathing practices, you know, movement of subtle systems like the eyes and the tongue and the hand and whatnot. But that's the ultimate goal is to get to that sea of, of nothingness, the, the void. Or, or to have an ongoing or relationship. Point. Or to have an ongoing relationship. Ongoing with relationship with it, because when you are in that, mm -hmm. you can see from that, that yeah. point of view. And your small ego fits in that space in its proper orientation. Got it. We find that it just happens spontaneously. We're not aiming for it, but it can happen spontaneously. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are all ways, all kinds of ways to do it by leveraging it intentionally. But yeah, for many people, mm -hmm. it just visits them. Yeah. So I think the, the second thing in understanding the kind of worldview that we get in the Hindu tradition. And in, in, in also in the person of Jain and the Buddhist tradition, which also emerged out of India, is that we are attempting to work with this reality of re embodiment. Mm -hmm. There's something that persists after death. There is, and, and, and it's described negatively in this tradition. It's like your residue, something that you're still attached to, some connection to this plane, which if you had perfected yourself in the previous lifetime, you would not, you would not spontaneously return, or you would be in a position to choose to return, to take on new karmas and therefore be drawn back into this earthly pain plant plane to do whatever spiritual work you might do. So you've graduated with the curriculum and you have choice now, you say. Yeah, and I think that's extremely rare. I think we imagine that it's much more common than it is, but I think most of humanity has gone, gone in this cycle and will stay here, you know, for quite a long time. I don't know what, what the eons hold for us, but, I um, consider it a glorious journey and, and yeah, fun. yeah. And I, and I think in my own experience that sometimes I had, I, at some point I had to learn to affirm that. I mean, I was much more, yeah. I think, uh, oriented in a monkish consciousness, which saw this world as something secondary or negative, 
Um, but it's also the celebration of the other half of reality. It's property. We, yeah. yeah. Nothing is meaningless, with, not meaningful without somethingness. I trust the process. I'm okay with it. Yeah. I'm not yeah. trying to escape yeah. it. I'm not, I'm not, yeah. Yeah, because pushing it can put us into ego states, right? If you really are trying too hard to be enlightened, you're you're liable to be pretentious and oppress others, and you know. Or it's like <laughs> to heck with the rest of you. I'm getting out of here in the first boat, you know, or something. I don't know. So, yeah. So, so this reality of reincarnation and all its subtleties is is what drives all the spiritual practices of you know the Indian tradition. I mean, they're definitely. Charvaka. There's a few other philosophies which are materialistic, like our secular philosophies. But for the most part, the traditions of India are oriented towards this basic orientation to Brahman or, or um, uh, Purusha, and this idea of the human body coming back and how do we deal with it? In a way, it's seen, it's usually cast in negative terms. I mean, in the tantric tradition it gets shifted a little bit in much more positive terms. This idea of even mukti where you're enlightened in this lifetime and it's much more glorious delicious experience but for the most part reincarnation is seen as a problem mm -hmm. that we have been given to solve okay and but also if you have that orientation like this is hell and i'm just trying to get to heaven in the next life you're not really honoring the earth and all its potential you're not seeing everything as sacred you're not showing up it, it seems to me you've already into original sin or something. I don't know. Yeah, and, and that's, that's not a bad way of glossing it. it. It's like an original sin. It's like the kind of curse of materiality that we've all been given. And that's much more of the conversation in the pre-tantric period. By the time we get to the tantric period, you know, coming on, on around, you know, uh, maybe fifth century, eighth century, then it's a much more affirmative idea. It's not quite, I think, the, the level of affirm affirmation that we get in the secular enlightenment cultures where individuality is awesome. And, you know, we're like the Greeks where every human story is worth telling and, and there's, there's a heroic, you know, orientation for the individual. It's not quite that, mm -hmm. but it, it's much more tribalized, much more group oriented. But there is a very basic affirmation of this world as Sri, as the, the body of the goddess, as beauty, as yeah. something to be delighted in. Um, so in the in the Indian tradition, it does shift at a later period. Beautiful opportunity to experience this world will go on. What we find in our work is this continual message of life, death, and rebirth. In the grandest cycles of time, we are promised to be reborn again in some other form. We find dissolution experiences a lot and this sense of freedom and this sense that life, death, rebirth, the endless cycles um yeah and how precious life is yeah actually i never thought of it that way it's a promise right it, it's yeah. a gift it's like how cool is that like mm -hmm. i don't have to do it all in this lifetime i've got endless opportunities it's a yeah. it's a blessing to come back again and again trust the process yeah yeah that, that's a that's a really nice way of, of putting it if we're happy where we are i i, th I think it's it's easier to work with joy and creativity and community and celebrate it. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. definitely the Christian tradition, right? The Christian, Christian tradition is one of joy. It's one of like, this world is the place where we do our good work. Um, mm. uh, I mean, I was raised in a very joyful Christian tradition and it really much, very much affirms this incarnation and a wonderful endpoint where you get to go to heaven um, I think we see that much more in the West, this emphasis on the potentiality of the individual human and the building of a utopian world. I mean, I think a lot of that, that philosophy has faded I think, in the last 30 years, but there's still this idea that technology is an experience of constant improvement and, and uh, there is providence and, and we are moving towards a better future. Um, but each individual has their kind of dynamic place in that. Uh, it's very much, I mean, we live in a life affirming, worldly affirming tradition in the West. I think that's uh, very much also a part of the earth-based religions and the pre-Christian religions. I, I grew up in an agnostic family. Mm. Um, there was spirituality, but my father was a businessman. He had a different, very different religion from my mother. Religion wasn't talked about. It was about moral um, duty. You showed up, you did your best, you're here with community, you're gifted with much. You owe it in return to mm. to pass on the, the blessings, right? Yeah, and there's a great right. optimism in yeah. the business world, in capitalism. I mean, 
it's yeah. always seeking better profits. Meritocracy, and, show up and do your best. Yeah, yeah, your yeah right. And it, it, there's an ethical code to it. It's very much like it's yeah. it, it's akin to a monk's life, right? Yeah. Okay, so reincarnation is the basis, and then so there's there's this awareness that when the body is left, your karma, because it was slowed by a material tie, is now unbound and has much more freedom to find its orientation mm -hmm. through the Bardo state into a new incarnation. So the, the, the blessing of the body in terms of the relationship to karma is that your karmas don't fruit instantly. If they did, there would be no way to work with them. Okay. You get conked on the head immediately. <laughs> when you immediately do something Positive bad. Effect, you know, touch it. Yeah. 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 So, but once that's over and we get this in every tradition, in some sense, some sense of final judgment, you know, no more time to make up for my mistakes, so, so, so to speak, mm -hmm. then the, the karma hits. Mm -hmm. It will draw what's ever left of your identity composition, what's called Atman in the tradition, into a state of confusion, into a state of some non-embodied experience um, before you reincarnate in this plane because you are still bound to it, are still attached to it by whatever choices you made or, you know, usually it's, it's, it's glossed as error, whatever error you made that hasn't been resolved and you will come into a karmic situation that is appropriate to your disposition. And it's usually, you know, one in which a family is experiencing similar and we would say neuroses or complications or challenges that you are or has actually has the same gifts right it works both ways um and often it's within within a similar family tree because that's your particular resonant or taste the taste of your atman or your curriculum you haven't learned that lesson yet you, you get to repeat class so our our sense of embodied spirituality is celebrating that this body is a vehicle it is an inner technology by which we can go through the door temporarily, have a glimpse of the alternate reality. Alternate reality, this reality, mere uh, images, two sides of the same coin, that there's a reciprocal relationship, there's a long-standing covenant of exchange, that it's the vehicle through which we get to journey there. So uh, rather a, a different orientation. Well, I would actually say- And that say, earth is yeah. sacred, earth is here. We get to be here on earth, she's embodied. Yeah, body of yeah. earth, our body, our health, her health, the two are related, right action, that we can remedy the, the relationship by ritual, right? By calling to the spirits, by working with the spirits, spirits being however you want to define it, whatever the, the larger sphere is. So there's remedies in community. Yeah. Very interesting to compare the worldviews. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't say they're completely divergent. I mean, like yeah, like I say, in, in the kind of uh, Vedic tradition and then the tantric tradition, there's a great affirmation of the experience of life. It never kind of quite, I think, reaches into the level of ego affirmation that we have in the Western tradition, or it doesn't have actually, I would say, that encoded sense of the possibility of joy and how profound that is from the Christian tradition. But... Um, it does affirm the workings of this world in its own way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's a different way. But, and I would, I would agree, it's not to the degree that we do it in the West or even in perhaps say the Wiccan tradition. So I can't say that I understand that. For well. us, joy and creativity and ecstasy is the birthright. And it's so readily accessible. So readily accessible. Yeah, yeah. Through, through a practice, this practice. We I see that all the, the time, sense of flourishing. Of and not just getting stuck on the terminology yeah. of, uh, uh, it's more the broadening of the human experience in general. Just that yeah. whole concept that we can have a foot in both worlds, that we can have that broader yeah. experience of all that life. We needn't to leave this to experience that. Right. The two simultaneously is the more powerful experience, the more according to our tradition. I think, yeah, the more tradition. readily accessible. Yeah. 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 yeah, interesting. Ah, now there's a posture. Looks like me. Yeah. So some people might recognize this person. This is BKS Iyengar, a very well known yoga ah, master. I have that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was a revolutionary book. It really changed yogic history. Yeah. 
big node, big node in the, in the historical conversation. So I just kind of grabbed this. It's Looks like Da Vinci could have done that overlay of the geometry too, doesn't it? But go ahead. Yeah, yeah it's imposing a geometric overlay on the, on the human body. And, and, and this kind of touches on something you and I were talking about earlier, Laura, about how there are geometries in the body's orientation. There are, in the Hindu tradition, they talk about the angles, you know, of the, where the limbs come together being energy nodes and that we can arrange those in certain patterns so that energy flows in a fortuitous way. So I think there's ways in which asana works geometrically in the arrangement of the limbs and the energy that moves through the limbs to create circuits that are valuable for transformation. Right. Activating certain meridian flows through the organs. And... Yeah, yeah. And then arranging them in certain patterns, which are more efficacious. Yeah. And this slide just kind of references what I talked to earlier. This is the Indus Sarasvati culture and a light map of it um, and images from it, uh, giving us kind of the historical starting point from our archaeological evidence of yoga, which I talked about earlier. And of course, this is the main seal, probably the most, the seal with the, it's packed with the most information of the, of the number of Pashupati seals with this yogic-like character on it. Animal yeah, ground. posture very similar to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a very basic yoga posture. Pull my screen. But you can also see that he's, he's holding a mudra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, mudra is a, is a technology. He's got, it looks like the heels are bound at the perineum. Mm -hmm. which is badrasana it's a it's a it's a kundalini pose to force energy up mm -hmm. that's the hallmark of all of these because you don't naturally sit in these these are intended it's not like the greeks lounging around right these are very specific postures that you uh purposefully take up yeah yeah, and that's a good argument for this being yogic rather than just, you know, some king who kind of happened to get a snapshot of him sitting on the throne. Yeah. 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 And you can, he's also, he's what he's, he's called itipalic. He has an, an erect penis. Mm -hmm. And that is, mm -hmm. that's a kundalini kriya that's been cataloged, you know, yeah. for, for men. Yeah, um, we see that a lot in our art too. Always an indicator of ecstatic flow of energy, right? Yeah, and fertility. Right, it's, yeah. it's also part of the fertility, early fertility cult. What about the headdress? What what are we seeing with the headdress? What is that symbolic of? And I see bison, cows, um, elephant. What what's the symbology? And I see it looks like writing, geometric writing up at the top. What is that? Yeah, and the writing hasn't been deciphered. We don't know what that script is saying or what it means. I mean, there's no Rosetta Stone which has emerged. Yeah. There's, you know, there's almost a ton looks of like runes or something. Yeah. The headdress has often been identified with three energy channels, but you know, mm -hmm. who knows what the headdress means? It's probably something guess... particular to that culture, I would guess. Do you, um, but do, it could do you imagine been... its horns? Are those horns, perhaps? They definitely look like horns. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. And it's been suggested that because these animals are floating around, it's kind of like they are subject to this figure, like he's a lord of the animal powers, and mm -hmm. hence the name of the seal, Pashupati, Lord of the Animals. That's what it means. Uh, okay. um, and I think that's that's a viable interpretation. Sure. Yeah. And, sure. and you you and I had, had talked a little bit about you know jewelry on the body, and it looks like figures wearing armbands, mm -hmm. you know, which can which could be used to facilitate energy. Uh, it looks multi-faced, like the later gods in the tradition. There's a face on the right, face on the left, face in the middle, which is suggestive ah, of interesting. Uh, yep. Suggestive of omniscience, you know, higher knowing. And, uh, and then the chevrons are pointing downward, um, and we see the, that arrangement in the three three, three yantra and other uh, mandalas, where the, the map of the human body is simplified in the triangles, which point up and down, animal power, gross power downward, uh, mm -hmm. celestial power, spiritual power upward. So that map is also on the image so just that whole host of things from like my point of view it's like this is an arbitrary this is this is a, a yogic diagram that's been given to us from very far back um you could say that i'm forcing the interpretation but it seems like the forest is there <laughs> you know we can argue with any one of the trees and say oh that's not yogic but when you put it all together 
it's a very strong argument for them having an orientation in these systems very, very far back. And even the clothing, the accoutrement, the mantles, the, the bling, the jewelry, whatever they, that they wear, seem, in our culture, right, all that's a signal, it's a language to speak to one another about status, about um, clubs that you're in, about branding that you're wearing, right, companies, whatever. But I think it's purposeful for our ancient cultures because we see so much of it very specific and some of it shared culturally. We can even say some culture to culture um, that is purposeful. So either it's enlivening the energetics if it's if it's a metal, right? And I know uh, Robert Lawler I talked to him in Voices of the First Day on the Australian Aborigines. He posits that the ochre, mineral-rich iron worn on the body, can activate something in the blood. It's magnetic. It's causing body flow. It's causing a resonance with Earth's magnetic field, perhaps purposeful. And so even wearing silver, gold, um, whatever, metal, or maybe um, other substances, horns, um, wearing a horn, what is that but a, a matrix of uh, very, very calcium laid down in a particular mm -hmm. pattern? Uh, the shape of it can, can do energetics. People used to use horns for hearing aids. Horns are, are focusing instruments. People suggest horns on a cow help it tune to to some subtle fields. Who knows? So I think that that it's an interesting, also purposeful look at some of the um, accoutrement that that people were wearing back then. I think there's a science to that as well. Is what I'm saying that we haven't yet deciphered fully. So yeah, it reminds me of a story of a. Uh, I guess the. Uh, army hired Indian trackers early on and they would ask them to um, abide by the uh, the grooming norms of you know the the ranks and so they would cut their hair and the Indians said that they could no longer track once their hair was cut because it was part of their sensory process mm -hmm. like long antenna out there yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think about and I think about you know, if you'll permit me, I mean, women have a higher emotional intelligence than men, and they tend to keep their hair longer. It's they're keeping their antenna in place so it can be utilized. Whereas men, you know, we're more focused on goal-oriented tool. We're going to get all that psychic material out of the way so that we can go forward. <laughs> be rational, um, be linear. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, Focus. and so yeah. there's a lot of correlatives there, I think. Well, even um, the twisting of the metal, we have a, a posture or two from the Celtic tradition and the torques that they wore, oh, yeah. the two different metals twisted, mm -hmm. create kind of a battery effect and energy moves like, like that, sure. you know, yeah. it's, it's, and it's a technology, I'm convinced. If we could use the instruments to decipher what's going on and how it's correlating and amplifying and being a transmitter yeah. receiver for our own energy, it would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. and there's a whole science. Of, I mean, that's not yeah. my knowledge base, but I know there's a whole science of the metals and mm -hmm. what kind of energies yeah. you know they, they bring in that they, they resonate with, and when you hold them on the body, they have certain purposes as well as as well as rocks and minerals. And, and that's not minerals. my knowledge base, yeah. but yeah, um, right. gemstones. That's operating. Yeah. The rest of it. Uh, Tony is saying, experiment with the electromagnetic influence on trance. Some nice metrics would be possible. Yes. Yes, that's that's on our list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The conch shell. Yeah, the conch shell. Mm -hmm. yeah. That spiraling energy. Right. And, uh, yeah. okay. Yeah, we'll continue here. And Tony also asked about pranayama. Bianca asked about the eight limbs of yoga. So I want to just put those, those questions in. Um, as well, as breath, we go along, breath technology. Let's get through the slides yeah. and we'll address all toning, this. toning a posture, mm -hmm. um, activating your instrument through toning, vibrating your body, another way of activating the instrument. So, a lot so much to cover. So and now we have the Indus Valley. What are we seeing here? Yeah, and these this is this is a slide that has more of those particular images that are drawn from the culture. Oh, yeah. um, I said there were a few of them, and so here's a picture of a variety of them and it's that that one that we we're looking at earlier is obviously more detailed um but it's this this image reappears throughout different seals that we find or steles little hunks of terracotta or hunks of rock those striations are are interesting too 
the, the what? Striations on the arm. We see some of that in some of the yeah. artifacts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's interesting. We see yeah, geometrics yeah. on a lot of artifacts. We have artifacts from the Neolithic of old Europe. Maria Gambudis is very fond of pointing out the chevron shapes, the, yeah. the bird face. The geometric patterns we see geometric patterns in trance a lot as a stage so that that the geometric showing up is interesting on on here yeah and that that, that whole idea of the triangle the body is, mm -hmm. you know, i think my is my pointer appearing on, on your oh, screen yes. mm -hmm. yeah so mm -hmm. i mean the body arranged itself in this i you know we think about pyramid power or, the, or anything that juts up carries energy with it Partly why, you know, a city full of skyscrapers is so exciting is because that energy is being pulled up from the ground or some place like Sedona. It's, you know, it's seen as a spiritual center. It has all those, those natural pillars. Spires of and, and, why we, rock. Yeah. and why we as humans, you know, channel energy more powerfully because we're vertical, we're vertical creatures. So we eventuate that by putting ourselves into pyramidic postures and oh, that's powerful for every kind of meditation, you know, body position is that it is like a pyramid or we're arranging ourselves so that energy will move upward so you have the inverted pyramid here on the chest and you've got the pyramid shape from just the the body from the head to the to the wider yeah and uh, you could also say nature creates ge um technology ge geographically geologically rather so you have limestone rocks weathered impregnated with iron is that a is that a vortex is there something to the whole vortex energetics mm -hmm. hot spots right. yeah interesting okay yeah and i think i think human beings congregate to places like that like new york city it sits on this huge hunk of magnetic granite you know? ah, and wow. no wonder it's like yeah. you know arguably the center of the world like so much culture happens there it's like people and i and i'm sure you feel that i we all feel that when we go to that city it's like yeah. we feel alive we feel charged and it's yeah. partly because we're sitting on an amazing an amazing geological site i was walking down a new york city street at 3 a.m once going oh my god the static energy is so present here it's buzzing yeah, yeah. with no yeah. cars on the street oh my god yeah, yeah. wow and I All think right, these so, teachers understood these subtle energies. Obviously, um, yoga is the whole science of of uh, these subtle energies. Yeah, and and I think when we say ancient cultures, we have to be careful because it, I think just like in our culture, there were es esoteric sects. We there was always orthodox. You know, there's always esoteric and exoteric. There was always orthodox and non-orthodox, um, orthodox and heterodox. Is if we're going to use a technical term. There's always been part of societies which pushed forward especially when you get civilizations sure. where you have a wide range of human occupation there's always been some set of people that were virtuosos that were spiritual virtuosos and we have the you know we can study the relics from that part of the tradition um and it's not to say that everybody was doing this it's, it's, un, it's actually actually it's highly unlikely but there were some group of you know experts who are doing deep exploration just like the people of today but we say we live in the age of science not everybody's a scientist Exactly. So, yeah, 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 or an Indo scientist, an Indo. And if you didn't have the technology uh, today pushing through these other bandwidths, maybe you could feel it more easily. Maybe mm -hmm. we're being jammed, our sensors are being jammed to some degree to the subtle energies by all of the radio waves and internet waves and da 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 waves running through us today. I mean, our, our technology is allowing us to seek ways of technologically detecting more of this energy we can see to the ends of the universe and back but uh, maybe we're jamming some of our own receptor sites yeah. So. yeah i would say in everyday life there's more distraction there's more you know electromagnetic magnetic waves in the air that's problematic but by the same token there's there's all of these people i think who are kind of living in a higher demographic who are scientists who are doctors and and technicians and they are doing yoga now and they're mm -hmm. doing you know mindfulness practices now and so they're getting curious about this material and we're starting to do scientific studies the and that's the the never spiritual technology. yeah i mean the, yeah. the objective world is starting to creep into this place that has mainly been subjectively since you know before this time yeah. and we're getting concrete evidence which I appreciate also that, that we have the whole marketplace of ideas and practices and technologies and histories available to us. 
at no other time in history have we had so much available to explore at our fingertips. We're not in one culture where it prescribed only it. We, we, get, to, we get to shop around, like, like you were describing your journey early on, till you happen on what resonates with you, what is calling to you so deeply. So. Yeah, we've got the internet. Yeah, we've got, <laughs> we got Zoom now. Yeah. So what are we seeing so here? These are, these are a bunch of images from Hampi, which is a, a site kind of recently discovered and discussed in scholarly circles. Um, it's a, these are images from the 1500s and there's been a lot of argument around, you know, the development of posture and when they developed and how they developed and how many postures developed. And we're starting to see that there was evidence of extremely, extremely complex posture and varied posture very early on in the tradition. Um, and how much of this is driven by, I mean, I would say it is designed to evoke higher energies, you know, probably Kundalini, um, but some of it is probably prompted by intuition, which is coming from pranic experience, from Kundalini experience. It's a, you know, back and forth dialogue. You're, you know, you're using the pump and you're priming the pump. Um, but it's so cool to see these images from so far back and to see their level of their complexity. So you mentioned earlier, tension can be a factor, pain can be a factor this arduous, more strenuous stuff can be a factor to push you over the edge. So that's well documented. Do you think that is what is happening here? I think there's always some part of that. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah. you stress the body to grow the body in, in every yeah. art. You stress the mind to grow the mind. Mm -hmm. um, there's always some way in which you attempt to push past boundaries to create more distant boundaries. So yoga is, is a powerful technology. You, have to, you know, you do have to use it carefully you can damage the body, you know, at the at the gross level, at the physical level, um, and you can create a lot. You can create psychosis. I mean, I lived in the Bay Area. I know it's there. <laughs> we um, people have pointed out in our practice that there always seems to be slight, not not extreme, slight tension in one part of the body, and I always thought maybe that's as much of an activator as placing a hand on a meridian point hmm. or an organ. That that yeah. slight tension that sometimes is required by holding the posture precisely. Right. Yeah, Interesting. yeah, Interesting. yeah. I would agree. Yeah, you're creating a specific tension in a specific point mm -hmm. to make energy move through that point mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. more efficiently or more powerfully. Yeah. And pain can arise spontaneously. It has nothing to do with the way you're holding it. Um, Goodman would describe that as clearing the energy block. Mm. And so you yeah. feel excruciating pain, very intense, and all of a sudden, whoosh, it would dissolve and it would feel cool. You'd feel a rush, cool energy. Um, yeah, and I would, I would, I would suggest there's some expertise needed there, I and mean, we wouldn't want to do that clumsily because you might, you know, you don't want to imagine that all pain is good. You want to use right. your discernment and apply it with some care. We advise do not put yourself in a position of pain, back off, do not do that. But if it can rise spontaneously, that really has nothing to do with the, the way you're, you know, your sore knee or your replacial, whatever. Okay. So, anyway, so I, I just, threw in some images from the progression of the tradition. There was a kind of a movement called Del Sartism, which was a Western evolute from a set of theater practices, which were used by a guy named Francois Del Sarte in France. Um, and they were very much like a postural practice. They really were a postural practice. So they would also use the eyes and the hands and different things, sort of like yoga does, but with the purpose of opening up the kind of human psychology for the purposes of performance. Um, but it became a fad in the United States before yoga arrived, basically in 1893 with um, Swami Vivekananda. One of the more well-known ones, because he, he was the one who brought yoga whole to the United States when he visited here in 1893. He was a strong personality. He was Western educated in his own country. He had a capacity to deal with the Western mind and translate Indian concepts and their kind of August nature, their their power and import to Western audiences. Um, and, you know, he also, you know, carried with him kind of the exotic persona, which had attracted people to him. He spoke, he was very well spoken, he was very intelligent, um, and had very prominent venues from which he was able to address people, went on a lecture tour through the United States, translated the Yoga Sutras for a Western audience. Um, and at that point, this tradition of Del Sartism got enfolded into the emerging 
postural traditions of yoga, which took some time to incubate. He taught posture to his students, but it didn't really um, take root. I mean, it took time for his work and the work of other teachers to kind of make it root in our culture, but it very quickly established a dialogue with the um, people who were spiritualizing Del Sarte's, Del Sarte's practices um, and there's this whole idea of harmonic gymnastics where you're working with the harmonies of the body. And so there was a rich ground for yoga to land, but it was coming from a purely Western orientation in the 1890s. Interesting. Long before athleisure and yoga wear. <laughs> yeah. Take yeah. a look at that. Yeah. Okay. Not Lululemon. And then this, this work really accelerated in the 20s and 30s because there was an, an upsurge in Western culture around physical fitness. Actually, this had started much, much earlier, as early as the 1800s, because people were starting to congregate in the cities and there was much, many more health challenges. There was no ways in which the medical infrastructure could handle it. Diseases were still ravaging populations and causing millions and millions of deaths. Bubonic plague was actually still active in the 1800s, um, not to mention cholera and red fever and all these things. I mean, you may have relatives that died from that. I had relatives that died from that just two generations back. Wow. So this movement towards physical culture and um, the idea of athletic Christianity mm -hmm. was um, something that moved into uh, Europe, United States, Australia, Canada, the Western world. And very early on, it started to have a dialogue with yoga and the yoga postures were translated into systems of um, uh, Western gymnastics, something we see now, <laughs> but it was actually happening clear back in the, in the 1920s. Um, so yeah, so this is work, work of the, of a, of a British teacher by the name of Molly, M Molly Baggett Stack. She had, her husband was a, um, a part of the British Raj that was running in India. So she visited in India. She learned some yoga postures. She brought them back to Britain and she formed her this thing called the stretch and swing system, which spread throughout the country, mainly practiced by women, mm -hmm. but it was a kind of a vinyasa yoga very early on, which used uh, oh. variations on the postural systems of, of, of India. Mm. Interesting, yeah. swing and set, okay. Yeah. Stretch and swing. Stretch and swing, yeah. Uh, and then in the later tradition, I mean, I'm just kind of walking through yoga history a bit sure. here. We, we get, you know, there's other traditions that came into yoga that were not a part of yoga proper from the kind of textual tradition. You had Surya Namaskar, which was a devotional practice, a set of movements that most of, our, of us are familiar with if we've done any yoga class. class. It was blended with practices from um, uh, Indian wrestling, these, these certain movements of Utkatasana, which you can see in the middle, which was called the Batak. And then the Don, which we think of as um, down dog, up dog, um, and uh, um, uh, Chaturanga, those were sets of practices from Indian wrestling, which were integrated in this devotional movement of bowing to the sun, which was its own separate tradition. And all those things got enfolded in the yoga, mainly through the work of a guy named Krishnamacharya, who was a chief teacher in the 1930s and 40s, um, who uh worked out of the Mysore palace and who was very influential and involved in a lot of western conversations particularly with the ymca um the king there wadya the fourth was a very rich man and he was very into physical fitness and very into the yoga tradition and had yeah. funded people like yogananda to come to america and his in-house yogi was krishnamachari who was the teacher of iyengar and was the teacher of patabi joyce and was the teacher of um indra devi other teachers who went out and popularized yoga in the modern period and he was the man who integrated this aspect of the yoga tradition, the basic Surya Namaskar system, up dog, down dog, chaturanga, which forms the basis for the moving yoga today. Yeah. And the sun salute, it looks like. It, yeah. it is the sun salute. Surya Namaskar is the, yeah. is the yeah. Sanskrit for sun salute. Gotcha. Right. right. Very cool. And then I just threw this in at the end, just kind of a mm -hmm. connection to your work, the kind of broader philosophical or technological understanding of the way that nada yoga or sabda yoga, the yoga of sound works in the body in relationship yeah. to the chakra system and that each of the, the pedals of the chakras, the different numbers of pedals 
have a certain bija mantra, seed mantra, sound, which unlocks them. Mm -hmm. And the richer yoga of sound uses chant systems, which are meant to work as kind of locking key to open up the energetic system through a relationship to those Sanskrit phonemes, the 51 Sanskrit phonemes, which are said to be the building blocks of all material reality. You can unpack that and reorient it for the purposes of personal of personal growth and transcend. And I see your 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 chart says the root chakra is the abode of Ganesh with his wives Vidhi and Siddhi. I really am so um, supportive of the personal relationship that we can develop with the gods, with the spirits, with the earth, with the cosmos. So that is that an indicator of the personal relationship that that one develops that we see even in our own body, these are the abodes of the elements of nature. Is that yeah, a, I mean, I mean, you can, do this, whole, you can do this view. through a devotional practice or what we call a bhakti practice. You can have a relationship to a God, which is said to kind of resonate um, in your body in a specific way. Um, I don't know as much as that as I sh about that as I should, but there are said to be certain gods that sit at the chakras and have dominance or have <laughs> sway over them. So praying to them, worshiping them can also be a, a way to work with that technological system. And, and yeah, Ganesh sits at the Muladhara chakra. He's the, the heavy guy who grounds it. You know, thank you for this. I appreciate this. I know that we barely touched on, I mean, in two hours, what can you really cover? Um, because this is a lifetime of study, as, as you have um, pointed out and that you're engaged in. The, the pranayama was brought up earlier. We have a breathing exercise. It was something that Goodman put in for us Westerners. Right, to have a moment's transition, breathing in a mm. rhythmic way to anticipate the, the regular read of, beat of a sonic driving. Yeah, so that was, that, as I said, that was kind of its own tradition. And it had regular conversations with the yoga tradition proper, and it's called the tapasic sets of practices. And it involved things that were much more aggressive, like there's, there's the, the panchagni, for example, where uh, a yogi would sit in the middle of five burning pots and one of them is or four burning pots and one is on his head in the middle of the noonday sun like an Indian, that, that's no, no minor minor experiences the, yeah. the capacity to deal with heat and generate heat in the body for the purpose of like burning out impurity so and that's much more of a um it's a much more aggressive practice it's kind of a flagellation practice it's a it's a way to attack the body and as they said dry it out Hmm. Ouch. Try it out. So it, <laughs> it, yeah, it, it, in a way, it has less activity in it so that only the energy that you want to move in it will move in it, which is very different from the yoga tradition, which is trying to create a, use, a juicy body, right? An open body, a oh, immortal body, a body that will, will have so much life force in it mm -hmm. that it will sort of, sort of like a, the dynamite around the early atomic bomb made the higher reaction of splitting the atom. It's the same kind of attempt to, to do that through prana, to make prana evoke kundalini in the yoga tradition. Because the tapasic practices are not, they're not a kundalini oriented practice yet. It has a very different philosophy behind it and a different way of working with the human form, which is very aggressive, very, very aggressive. Yeah. But it is working with inner heat, that idea of tapas, tapas heat. Let's yeah. go to Tony who has his hands up first. Hi, Tony. Tony Hall. Well, yeah. well, uh, of course, a, a very interesting discussion. And uh, as a scientist, <clears throat> my mind goes to metrics. And I'm familiar with the abundance of, of research that was done in the TM period, um, maybe faulted because the people who did research were advocates for a result. Uh, but there was other research done by Benson at Harvard and a number of other places. Uh, is there a body of research on the yogic practice that, that it stands as being credible now? And are there any analogs that we could use to, if we wanted to study the ecstatic trance tradition? Well, you guys should probably answer the second half of that question better than I could. Well, the, um, analog, the analogs I'm interested in and, and what we've learned from the studies of yoga, which are probably much more extensive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and those mainly have to do with um, working with keeping us out of fight or flight systems. I mean, 
Um, we're going to settle the production of cortisol in the body, which produces so many of the chronic diseases, which are part of our modern culture. Yoga keeps you in that rest and digest state. Um, it keeps you in a more steady metabolic state so that you're creating an ecosystem in the body, which is less likely to incubate disease. Um, there's a breadth of studies, but that's kind of the main thrust of them is that you're working to calm the vibrational system, the nervous system, which has a relationship to the endocrine system, which oh, okay. secretes things in the body, which are useful for defensive activity, but not useful for a long life. Um, that's been pretty much the main thrust of studies around asana and pranayama and even mindfulness practices as far as simply health, health goes. I mean, completely outside of all the other you know, capacities for you know, stretching out the ligaments and tendons so that there's less injury or creating a calm mind so that there's more awareness so that you can pay for, you know, operate better in sports situations or even in other decision-making processes in you know, your work life. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's just a rough overview of the direction that objective studies have taken in looking at postural practices. This is an ongoing. This is an ongoing conversation that we've been having because the original research done on ecstatic trance postures now, unfortunately, is about thirty years old or longer. We need to have some new work. We have a couple anthropologists that are working with us, and people like Tony, who is an astrophysicist, who want to do more more documentation of the effects of the posture work on the physiology and mm -hmm. uh, what what are those parameters on how can we gather more and more data. Just looking at what's happening today, there's so much more uh, availability for for uh, taking things into a lab and seeing what the the impact and the influence is. So that's I think that's part of what your question was, Tony. Is like where what's available nowadays? What have we discovered about yoga? Because yoga is such a popular forum that's probably being uh, extensively um, studied. Can we learn from the from the the world of yoga that we can apply? Yeah to the work of ourselves and what do we, we even want to study right we, what, we have so we many start? interesting is, experiences yeah. Yeah, exactly. well i think yeah. the similarities the differences uh where everything lies in various spectrums and yeah. for example yeah. we, we we heard earlier about about sedona and new york city and magnetic fields yeah and, yeah. and how, how that may have an effect um uh, i'm uh, curious about that one can certainly uh, create a situation where, where both yogic or ecstatic trance is done in a situation where one is shielded from electromagnetics. Um, is this worth doing? Is there, is, are there metrics that would come out um, that would be similar? And are there other instances where it'd be very different? And Maybe go deep into those caves, right? Where, where well, <laughs> there've yeah. been gamma well, ray studies. There's been lots of- Well, well yeah. gamma rays have always been, so <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering where can we take this? One difference with between trance uh, postures and yogic postures are, of course, the uh, the accompaniment by uh, sound induction. And I, I guess this can be done in yoga. I don't know how often it's done in yoga. Most often, my experience has been in silence. But I, I wonder if there's any experience there. Sort of like the, the ecstatic postures are sort of like a combination of two things. That we would see in the world of yoga, we got the holding the posture, but we're also then introducing the sound at the same time, sort of like the induction of meditation. Only in this case, we're trying to induce something that mm -hmm. can take us to a different aspect of what you would call meditation, and that is, is that we're doing an, an ecstatic experience. We're looking for some enlivening, something to happen that goes beyond it's just highly that, energetic, you know, highly highly energetic versus yeah, the traditional. going on? The traditional approach to the, the void may come, but it's spontaneous. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're different objective, but they both involve posture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yes. And that's, and that's of course, of course that, that, that's the common element. Or, um, mm -hmm. and I don't know how many overlaps there are between the the postures that we find and those in the yogic tradition. I well, think, or you commented that uh, that oh, this looks like one of ours at the very early uh, posture we saw. Um, there probably are not a lot, but there may be a, there may be a handful of them, and it would be interesting. To we see that. took a Paul and I took a moment to put together just cross-legged postures. Since you brought it up, let me go ahead and throw a few of those up, and I'm going to take more questions after that. But thank you, Tony. That, you're bringing up a really good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to take you here. So what we've done is we've taken several of the postures that we do, 
It, was, it kind of has a resemblance to yoga postures. It's not, they're not exactly the we same. We wanted to get Eric's input on So this. we haven't even started that process of looking specifically. But here's one from the Princeton University Art Museum, the Mayan Oracle. We have the cross-legged yeah. position. We're holding kind of our hands in a specific position. We think of this as, as kind of You a, could call that maybe a mudra. Maybe yeah. not a classic That's right. from yeah. yoga, but a exactly. mudra of sorts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we'll go to another one. Where we can hold a posture. This is we call it the Mayan whistle. It comes from Guatemala. The arms are wrapped in a certain way. The feet is very specific. A lot with the mouth position. too. The yeah. teeth, the mouth, the tongue. You yeah. mentioned the tongue earlier, uh, Eric, as being important. This is again from Ecuador. Uh, we got another posture where we have our hands, legs crossed in a certain position that we use as an ecstatic trance posture that we've been doing for uh, more than thirty years or so as as a practice. And uh, I won't talk about the specific categories of experiences because it will get us distracted from mm -hmm. just the idea just looking that we're, at we're looking at posture position yeah. itself. Here's another one. That Look we how see. specific the hands are. Yeah. This is Chichen Itza. Chichen Itza. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. That's why I have you here. Keep me keep straight. And that's a mirror also. Yeah. Mirrors are portals. Yeah. So and we just, we just yeah, mm -hmm. created a, a representation of that Chinese mirror. Chinese surface. This is we call the Mayan empowerment. Yeah. We call it that. that yeah. It has another name. Um, right, right. Mirrored figure. Yeah, yeah. that's true because I think it has a mirror. It had a mirror. There's a, there's a mirror that went right under the arms and above well, the Well, with the, the hands are holding, there's a round circle on top. I don't have an overhead yeah. view, which is sort of holding up a mirror mm -hmm. with that mask on top. Yeah. As another example of that. This is, of course... Uh, Sir Nunos. Sir Nunos, right. It's a very right. famous, yeah. And, and I noticed, Eric, you had one where the hands are up like that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah it's a similar figure from a different culture, but... Yeah. Yeah. We're just trying to see some worldwide impact. There's a tremendous and this look at the surrounding by animals, as right. in that early, yeah. early one. Yeah, and, uh, and the headdress. Trem mm -hmm. Tremendous. And the amount. headdress, horns on the headdress. Tremendous Mesoamerican impact because they have so much sculpture. But we're trying to have some representation for different parts of the world as well. Even though we're now we're back to Mexico. Uh, Chal Chi Huitlacu, yeah. god of rain, goddess yeah. of rain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Olmec Prince uh, is one of the postures that we've been doing. I'm just going to keep moving and mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll mm -hmm. call it too, too much detail. Um, this is from the U.S., from the Indian Mounds in Georgia, Etowah, Etowah. And so there was two, uh, like a male-female representation side by side found. And so we've explored that one as well. Of course, there's tons of stuff from uh, when, Egypt. When you look at Egypt, mm -hmm. and yeah, just, uh, of course, the scribes Very all had to lay cross positions. But, that they do. So and, I didn't show mm -hmm. representations of scribes because they're scribing. That's what they're there for. That's their role. Right. That seems to be an activity, this not is where the ritual hands instructions. Are in a different position where they're not journaling mm -hmm. or doing something else. Maybe he's receiving uh, what to write. Something more. We don't know, mm -hmm. but that's part of the thing. Like Guatemala again, another another interesting artifact, and in that mm -hmm. they've taken the time to to carve and do. And so part of the mm -hmm. impact of what Dr. Goodman looked for was saying, after seeing the impact on the, um, on the physiology of yoga postures, she wanted to say, well, let's go back to some of these other ancient civilizations. Okay. So, so that's, that's the, uh, that, that's the, the core impact of what we have been investigating. The Institute mm -hmm. now is, is almost 50 years old. We've been doing this practice now with you know, 100,000 students across the planet doing this practice to see where it's going. But at the same time, we don't. Uh, we are still uh, looking at it as if we're in the infancy of discovery. We love the fact that we're still finding more and more knowledge and, yeah. and, uh, and data to document this. We and need more scholars, Eric. Come yeah. and join our yeah. side. Come do a posture with us. Yeah. And we'll come do a posture with you if I, if yeah. I can find in that position. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll send ambassadors to yeah. each other's camps. <laughs> Yeah. Give me a special seat. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Who else has comments? Well, um, James well, James Harris. is coming up as our guest in oh, a couple months. Okay. Uh, James, James, if you're a, a, oh, a wonderful scholar and researcher <laughs> who worked with Felicitas, worked with Maria Gambudas, has uh, so much to share. James, uh, are you game for at least saying hello? Good to uh, see I you. Have several comments I'd like to, like to make. Sure. Uh, one is. Uh, in my training, having to do with meditation, and I, I'm primarily a philosopher, I guess, but also a psychotherapist, the notion of inner space is, is something I've uh, was mentioned. And I would personally 
like to expand the term to inner space time. Because in the general uh, theory of relativity and in quantum mechanics and cosmology, it's all space time. It's all connected. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're the same thing. Yeah. And there and that would be corrected. And Thank that would you. bring in instead of the word possibility, the word potentiality. Oh, I love that, that. Uh, we're seeking our inner space time experience of our potential unfolding mm -hmm. like bombs unfolding of the implicate order right uh there's, there's, there's this unfolding so it was wonderful to hear the discussion of kundalini as unfolding this is new to me so that was great eric and uh i, I would just add the temporality in there it cannot be separated from space it's a good point uh, a second, a second uh, comment I have is uh, on uh, pranayama. I just completed with Alama Migmar in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a one-year retreat on pranayama, because mm -hmm. in the Sakya Buddhist tradition, one of the founders is Virupa, who is one of the founders of Hatha Yoga. So yoga is that yoga is powerful part of component of Sakya Buddhism. So I completed this one year retreat, which was once once a day for a whole, whole year. And the first, and I had two most vivid experiences in that year. The first was about mid year of the retreat when doing the pranayama, I could see all my bones. Yeah. And the second thing was towards the end of the retreat, I could feel my whole body refleshed. All the bones were refleshed. So I take this as the a rebirth experience, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, so life, death, and rebirth all took place through pranayama, a mm -hmm. deep extended pranayama practice. Mm -hmm. which was totally new to me because I'd only done like a weekend pranayama before that mm -hmm. and my <laughs> yoga trainings, which are practically non-existent. But um, so that's the second thing I wanted to say. And the third is because I'm doing research on uh, reincarnation in Siberian ethnography and uh, East Asian into North America for indigenous peoples in North America. What gets reincarnated? in Tungusic uh, tra religious tradition, when the soul is transferred from the lower world where it's first sent to the celestial world and then is reincarnated is what in the Tungusic language means the creative initiative process. Hmm. It's not a abstract symbol of some soul it's not an anthropomorphic what's reincarnated is the creative soul hmm. so this to me is something i'll be thinking about working on i'll be giving a talk at the young center in uh, maine in february about this i want to be talking about reincarnation as the creative potential process which is the same as the space-time inner world hmm. Come and talk um, with us. That's a, real, that's a real attractive concept. And then Rilke, the poet Rilke, all of his life was talking about eternity as this eternity. And again, the space time and the reincarnation as a creative principle, as the life, death, rebirth, they all go together. Mm -hmm. And that's and the, the eternal um, now. And that's the eternal now what Kunalini is aiming for is that reinstallation, so to speak, of that creative potentiality for creative work. Anyway, that, that's my comment. And that's very validated by people who've had Kundalini awakenings. They often feel a deep eruption of creative activity in their lives. Like the woman I, I mentioned that I talked to just before talking to you guys today, she wrote a whole novel after a Kundalini awakening. Mm -hmm. And she didn't tell me the time period in which she did it, but she made it sound as if it was quite instantaneous. Mm -hmm. So that those are not uncommon stories. So it, it very much aligns with what you're saying, James. 
Um, uh, I can add a fourth thing, which is the most powerful experience in my life was doing ten, doing four 10-day summer intensives with Stan Groff, Christina mm -hmm. Groff, and Jack Cornfield. Mm -hmm. So um, in that experience, I had some people were having wild kundalini experiences. So we're just doing yoga nidra. We're just lying down you know, in that yoga position. And, and, and then there was loud music and the hyperventilation breathing. So that spontaneously triggered, and Groff would told us, it will all happen spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Don't try and do yeah. anything. Yeah. You're just in the shavasana, listening to the music, and then whatever your psyche, whatever your kundalini wants to produce, it will produce. And that was a transformative experience for me. It freed up trauma that I never remembered. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, it, 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 the process involved pain points all over my body. Mm. And Stan Groff pressed each one of the point, points with his elbow mm -hmm. and each one relieved, released a trauma memory in childhood. Mm. Wow. So, <laughs> wow. That's an amazing this, report. This to me is, this was mild kundalini compared to some people who are sort of spontaneously jumping off their cushions and things like that and running around. Mm -hmm. And so then after those experiences, I went to Kweamungwe and did an intensive healing session. And that helped heal what happened in the childhood experience, which came up in the memories. Mm -hmm. So it's all complementary. The posture, the healing postures were highly powerful. Mm. Uh, with, which I did with Felicitas. The healing postures and, uh, and that uh, breath work. Mm. So, um, that's all I have to say. Those <laughs> wonderful <laughs> talk really because cool. I've never talked in public about any of this practice. So you you, you have uh, like the first? To, uh, yeah. <laughs> to, to talk about it. So thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you, James. Um, yeah. We look forward. To I should be going. Yeah. Yeah. I should be going. He's he's yeah. got such a rich body of research yeah. back to the Paleolithic, looking at posture. I mean, just. Just on and on, James. We look forward to more Unfortunately, from you. We're out of time for Thank you. Well, I just want to say that a lot of people describe in our experiences Kundalini rising, um, chakras being activated, and it's interesting how cross-cultural, um, because it's so well known. Yoga. We don't know the depth of yoga, but the terminology is out there. It's so integrated in our culture in so many ways. We're, and so, yeah. you know, I appreciate you giving that. more depth and breadth. Uh, of understanding to the to the deeper deeper we just touched on it again it's, it's like edwin turner um an astrophysicist out of princeton i said give me an overview you know of the cosmos and he did and he goes oh i really wanted to go deep but to touch on it our two hours is up and i feel the same way our time flies and we just, just touched on things because i know like you said any one topic could be days of of conversation to really understand it so you'll have to come back and talk more so Love that. Do yeah. It. Thank you. I know you've got thanks to run much. off to an appointment. We have a few more minutes to, so to share. Yeah. 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 And thanks for all the people who spoke up and sent notes in the comments. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everything. Wait a minute. I just asked yeah. everybody to turn on their mics. And, so they and what do you want to say by way of conclusion, everybody. Eric? Okay. First uh, of all. Pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> pay attention, Laura. Good. Attention. Sum up. All say of us. Say goodbye. You. Say goodbye. You guys. Bye bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. But we have, we have 10 minutes if you'd like to talk a little more. Any comments that we didn't well, get that Bianca you just want to... Please, Bianca. Bianca would you, like to share your... you made some uh, interesting observations. We want to hear, Bianca. Sure, yes. Hi, everybody. Um, for me, coming, you know, I'm a 30-year yogi. Um, I came to yoga after a, a spinal injury and stuck with it ever since and then certified to be a teacher. And so I've done a lot of yoga work and um, so I came to the ecstatic trance experience from that um, extensive yoga work. And that's, for me, the postures are super, super easy to hold because I'm used to, you know, sitting cross-legged for like, you know, a couple hours and all that is no problem. But what is really interesting to me is that in ET, 
um, the direct experience of downloading information and the spiritual connection to me is more direct and more immediate in ET than it is in yoga. Now, in yoga, where that comes for me is in the higher limbs of yoga. And I'm a little bit surprised that we didn't talk about that um, because asana is the third limb. There are two below that. And then there are the next ones, which are the pranayama and then dharana and dhyana, which are really concentration, which ties all into the intention work. So um, to me, the two, seeing the difference in how I, I really think that part of why ET is such a direct portal to ET, the you mean ecstatic trance yeah. ecstatic trance sorry yes um that it, it is um i think the ritual is a huge part of it um that you're really setting the um stage if you will for opening up the portal which in yoga you do to some degree but not as direct as in et for me anyway and uh so i love both of them um, you know, I continue to do, you know, both practices and happy to come back for more ET. <laughs> yeah. You know, as we say, all these practices are valid and rich and beautiful and effective. And, you yep. know, I imagine the clinics of the future will be about energy, will be about these subtle energies, will be about all these, mm -hmm. the full capacity of the, of the body, brain, mind, soul, and that we can walk in and you'll have different modalities all right there and yep. you can crisscross from one to the other because as james harrod was describing they each have their role to bring this up to move this over here to do this mm. they're all they're all effective one at a time right we don't like to mix yeah. them because there's a it, it's yeah. shift you know come back yeah. to center we always say come back to center like in tennis you go swing come back to center get ready for the next one <laughs> Um, right. Yeah. But they're all available to us. They're all yeah. have their... Well, I think what you said earlier was great about that we we have this, this smorgasbord of, right, we have this exposure through the internet yeah. now. And I think what's really important is to say, follow your own frequency. Follow what is frequency <laughs> specific right. to you, right? You're just saying whatever yeah. you resonate with, right? And that might be a different thing at different times. Mm -hmm. um True, so but so i much is, absolutely yeah. it changes and it morphs as we morph right mm -hmm. so but yeah it, it was interesting to look at the because i specifically look at these two systems among a couple more and and breath work absolutely essential um and there's yeah. you know more breath modalities for that um so very cool oh, yeah thank you, bianca. thanks so yeah. much bianca appreciate that sure yeah <laughs> I guess Tony has his hand up again. Tony, did you want to share something more on that? Well, it, it, it's a quick question. Um, sure. uh, James had mentioned when he talked about the the latter work with Cornfield et al. Um, a sound, and I was wondering if he might say what that sound is. Yeah. Um, oh, James. Well, uh, the sound was uh, Christina. Christina Groff was in charge of the sound, and at least two of the intenses, and the sound is just. Uh, lots of different types of classical music, uh, uh, indigenous music, uh, probably uh, West African drumming music. It was all in, built to a crescendo after about an hour and a half or two hours or more. And she was in charge of that. So it's all different. There's, there's a classical music mixed in and she did every session differently. Oh, so there wasn't one formula. You know, sometimes I think we get together and we give ourselves permission, right? We set an agenda. It's kind of like the placebo effect. Here's a safe container. Take a pill if that's your modality to have a, a pharmaceutical or come here to this container. That is another modality and a, and, a, and a container. Have the expectation of this happen. And I think the body is so ready to accommodate when we direct it, when it's directed to healing. Do you think, James, that there's, you? I mean, you're a psychologist. You look at the psychology of us. We have miraculous healing powers at our fingertips. We just need to know that we can employ them. What do you think? I think Eric, Eric Shaw summarized it all in the best possible way that it, it is a kundalini. It's an implicate unfolding of one's yeah. uh, uh, psyche, one's ontogenesis, and uh, it knows everything that needs to happen. That's what Thank I learned you. from Stan Groff. It totally. Yeah. And you're going to go through the rebirth process, the birthing matrix, as Stan Groff called mm -hmm. it. Mm 
-hmm. and Christina Grove, you're going to re go right through that again. Wow. So that, that to me is it. And it's the amazing. trans, the trans, the ecstatic trans postures allow us to touch constantly in different ways into that process and in, in a more in a simple, quietudinous way. <laughs> yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, they're, they're essential. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. James, would you comment on, on your experience with sound induction during intra ecstatic trance in this context? Uh, well, I, I would, I be, I'm certified uh, uh, trance facilitator. I've done a group, I did groups for over about yeah. a five to 10 year period. And then, so I know heard 300 individual experiences reported back after the work. And I do, uh, I, I did some harner training with, with uh, drumming, but I prefer the Kwayamungwe uh, rattle. So yeah. I, I use rattle. <laughs> so you use rattle, rattle, but but in terms of the analog to what you experienced with the grass and cornfield, uh, it, it it seems like there's a big contrast there. And I'm wondering how these is, is there any information, anything we could learn from that? The the structure of the gruff uh, retreats was uh, was a, it was a half day you would do in the holotropic breath breath work, mm -hmm. and uh, then in the evening. Uh, you after dinner you would uh, uh, make uh, you would report in your small groups uh, what you experienced or or you wouldn't have to say anything if you don't want and uh, my experience and you were given cray paws and paper and you could paint you could draw your experience <laughs> we did that uh, too that's yeah. what I that's what I did in, that, in yes. the crop yeah. retreats and then every time I facilitated uh, uh, trans groups, I had everybody, I handed out crepas, paper, pens, pencils. I just said, record your thing. And, I, and to me, that was from the Noscopy book by Frank Speck, where uh, the Noscopy, now called the Ainu people uh, in Eastern Canada, when they had a trance experience of their own or a dream, a dream experience, they were obligated to make art out of it. Oh, wow. If you mm -hmm. didn't make art out of your trance or dream experience, you have disrespected your experience and the deity that you're that that sent you, whether it's mm -hmm. the beaver, the bear, the caribou, or the mm -hmm. mosquito. They had four major animal spirits. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I would I gave I told that to my people in the groups and then I had them do their share their experiences as much as they wanted afterwards and produce art and that's what I did when I came from the my post Graf retreat experiences with Kwayamungwe healing practices I painted every one of my trance experiences so there's like four or five of them from that healing intensive. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Um, you know, you never know what insight you're going to pull from this, but I pulled several. You never know when a, where a conversation is going to go. You have a starting point. You yeah. kind of have an end point, And it's this wonderful meander. I always trust the process. Well, and so it's always a surprise and a delight. So the cosmology this is, behind Indian philosophy and, and yoga yeah. posture, it's a, it's a breadth of, of knowledge. It's not something you sit down in an hour and, and grasp. And no, so it's lifetime. He was scratching the surface trying to say, well, yeah, we can go here or we can go here or we can go here. Because it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's Well, there broad. were key questions we, we wanted to ask we first. To, there's, there's, there's many more the, layers. The impact yeah. of holding posture specifically itself so that we can make some comparisons. So that's, that's yeah. I think. It makes life richer and more beautiful and more interesting. And it connects us. It connects us to ourself, our full self. It connects us to one another, our community. It connects us to Mother Earth. It connects us to the cosmos. It is that connective tissue mm. that we, I think, that we seek. So many ways of, of activating. John, did you want to say something? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to hear from John. <laughs> Hi, John. Hi. Uh, sorry I had to come in at the end here, but I've been listening. So fascinated. Uh, I, I feel like there's something from the very beginning of Eric's talk that, that I have that stays in my mind. So I feel like if I don't share it, it's sort of like, you know, kind of constipation, which is that he was talking about 
where these the first images were found, you know, of um, some of the yoga postures. And he said they Pakistan. Reminded, yeah. Yeah. They reminded me when he was talking about the Indus Valley of, of some of the um, um, boundary stones from from Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm wondering whether or not there's a big, huge difference in terms of like the ecosystem, in terms of just not the physical, but also the psychological and spiritual. And people come from a culture where it's the water, like in Sumeria, the first city-states, they were very close to the ocean and it was actually the water from the tide coming in that would push the fresh water up into the cistern. And Enki, who was the god of wisdom, it had to be an empty cistern and that cistern was sort of underground. So the water came from below. And it seems like there, I've seen these, these uh, images of, um, of the serpent in Sumeria and there's one which is almost comical of this huge, looks like a massive uh, column rising from the serpent. And way up above is the people and the gods, but underneath is this folding serpent. So I feel like it's very fascinating. It, this seems like a long time ago, but into the Indus Valley, if people came from the north and they worship more fire because it's a cold place, in warmer places, fire actually can be very desiccating and destructive. So the hidden value of the water coming from below is a very different way of relating to sort of life giving than to think of the light coming from above. And so in some places in the world, it's actually the winter time, so to speak, where the planting is done, you know, and, and the summertime is actually, we've got to hide our seeds. We have to sort of stay out of the sun. So to me, it was like a huge, a huge topic there. And so I just wanted to, Thank you. you know, speak that in there. It's so interesting how our environment shapes our cosmology and shapes our practices from agriculture to ceremony to ritual to what materials are available mm -hmm. and how shared this is. I want to talk to the researcher who says there are two mother cultures in the world and trace those back even as far as the Paleolithic and beyond. I think that's we're going to see that we are one family. And as Brent is saying, eventually you become aligned with one path. Right, mm, yeah, and we are one family. So All thank right. you for that. Well, John, so, good, good. I'm glad we held on for your comment. <laughs> yeah, it was thank good. You, yeah, you. yeah. I appreciate, appreciate that. Okay, brother. Hey, thank you all for being here. And um, yeah, so be healthy, be wise, and we'll see you next time here on the Sunday conversations. And continue to communicate with us. We really, we, I mean, this whole thing is based on community. It's not about Laura and I. Uh, pontificating from our side of the computer screen. We want to have everybody be a part of the community. So. What we'd really like is if everyone was a researcher in your own home country, <laughs> your own, you know, your origin, country of origin, or where we you're have living now. If you're and do interested. Some, go yeah. to the museums, find mm -hmm. the ancient artifacts, take pictures of them. Yeah. Um, look at the mythologies, look at the myths, look at the stories of your area. Let's keep this ancient knowledge alive and activated and celebrated. All right. Bring our ancestors forward. As okay. we, yeah. Thank you, each of you. Thank you so much for being here and blessings and we'll see you next time.